I just want to ask Ken like one or two questions of my own and then throw it open to the floor because I'm sure you've all got questions that, that are on your mind. Uh, but can, can you maybe take us through what led you to this project in the first place? What, 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 what prompted it? Um, well, um, but first of all, th thanks, thanks for sharing it again. Um, thanks for coming. Um, it's a spectacular cinema. I've forgotten how good it is. Um, and as you said, it's great to see it on celluloid. Um, when you see digital, you get used to seeing digital prints, but they're thin, really. And celluloid is just a better medium. And what a pity it's gone. Um, the, the film began... We, Jim Allen and I talked about doing this film for a long time. Um, Jim was... Um, Extraordinary man, really. He was a he was a man from Manchester. He was a, he'd been a building worker, a dock worker, um, a miner, uh, and he worked as a political agitator. He would go from building site to building site to to build a, a union branch, then get the sack and move on somewhere else. Um, he was a great great man and, and wrote wrote wonderfully muscular dialogue. Um, and we took, because the Spanish Civil War is, is, well, as we said, it's wholly writ, you know, for people of the left. It was the first fight against fascism. It's, um, the international solidarity was probably greater in people's memory than in reality, but it was still very important. It revealed the real nature of Stalinism for everyone to see. You couldn't know the story of the Spanish Civil War and still believe that Russia wanted to take over the world because they plainly didn't. And it was demonstrated there more clearly than anywhere else. It exposed the two false leaderships that have, that have plagued the working class movement for the last century, which is Stalinism and social democracy. And they both betrayed the revolution in Spain. So it worked, it's, it's, it's a he for the, for the left. It, it's it's an extraordinarily important story, and we wanted to try and have a go at it and um, failed, um, and then we finally managed to get it together. And D Jim Jim didn't go to Spain because he getting him into the centre of Manchester was a difficult enough. So um, <laughs> getting him to Spain was impossible. And Re Rebecca and I stood in the middle of Barcelona um, when we thought of doing it and. And just thought, we'll never do this. We don't speak Spanish. Who is going to talk? But then once... To begin with, people didn't want to talk. It was too, it was too uh, fresh. And, and still, after those years, this was 1993, I suppose, it was still too, too close to people's experience. But then, of course, once they started, they didn't stop. And the thing just gathered, gathered momentum from then. So you, you very much worked with a kind of uh, uh, research, direct primary research, mm -hmm. with, with survivors, veterans, people who, who had a direct experience of the, of the Civil War, and you developed it that, that way. Um, well, yeah, did Jim wrote the script. No, I mean, that, that was to amplify Jim's work. I wrote it. Um, so G Jim constructed the script. The, we did, weren't certain how to end it, and... Um, we weren't certain how to end it, uh, but, but Jim basically wrote the characters, he wrote the dialogue, he wrote the, he wrote the script, he wrote two-thirds of... Ah, I've gone. Thank you. Um, he, he wrote two-thirds of the, um, uh, the, 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 the collectivization debates, really. And, um, so he, he, it's almost all Jim's words, but we weren't certain how to end it. And then um, one of the guys we took around, we found, was a man, an extraordinary man called Juan Rockabert who had uh, fought with the Poom, and he'd been forced to live in France for most of his life. Obviously, he fled to France, he'd lived there all his life, and, and was then, in the 90s, coming back uh, for the, uh, the, the previous few years. And he took us round the places. And there was one, one great moment when, when we went in a bar in some little village, and uh, we, the, there were two or three locals at the bar, and they said, what are you doing? And, and Juan Rocabé said in, in Spanish that we're exploring the, um, the his, where there'd been battles in the Civil War. And one of the old guys, he said, yes, he said, here, he said, I killed five fascists here. And, <laughs> and, and one rocker bear looked at him and said, no, no, he said, I killed five fascists here. And uh, there was, um, 
So there, there was extraordinary stories. But th this, then Rockabert told us a story of how his unit had been disarmed by the new army, new Stalinist army. And it was so powerful, we thought that that's, that's the end of the film. That's it. And, and that was the scene that we did. And when we shot it, um, it was extraordinary because he was there watching it. Um, and two or three other people who had fought in the war. And he stood on the, the raised bit further along from where the, the army came and pointed their guns at the militia. And as, as we filmed it, the tears ran down his face. And it was like it was the day. And that, the impression that made on the, the, the people in the militia who, who, you know, we'd been living it for six weeks. And, and the man standing there and then interpreting his story was, I think, probably one of the most moving days I've, I've ever spent with. It, it was extraordinary. I was also going to ask, uh, because my own knowledge, which is very minimal, uh, negligible compared to yours, obviously, but I, I wondered if you were influenced by Orwell, because George Orwell's relationship with Poom had, 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 had a similar experience in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did, 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 you, did you have Orwell in your mind in, in some way, Orwell's experience, or, or not? Um, Perhaps not especially. Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the... Um, it's, it's a primary source because Orwell lived, Orwell li went early, he fought with the Poom, he went through those experiences, he was in Barcelona in the, in the May days, I um, mean, all, all that, that happened. An absolutely central book. Um, there are others, um, the Red Spanish Notebook is one, um, there are others, and, and obviously we, there were some, we met some people who'd been through it who'd fought with the Poom. So uh, we met a woman in the market in Barcelona who was so furious that she'd been, from being a fighter, she was turned into a cook. And yeah. she was furious. Um, so we, obviously we, you know, we, we heard a lot of first-hand stories too. But all were absolutely central. And I, I know other people have questions, I just want to ask you, uh, working with actors, uh, that's such a... Uh, Wonderful performances from from uh, from from Ian Hart, obviously, and Ian Boleyn, and uh, and Paul Lavity, I'm thinking of. Uh, did you improvise much with them, or did they work directly from the script? And how did it did it work? I mean, did um, well, the, it was a mixture, really. I mean, if, if you talk to them, they say they improvised everything, but actually, it was it's mainly the script. <laughs> but, 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 but we had, um, I mean, we we did have surprises. Um, I mean, the, I mean that scene at the end when they saw the, apart from Vidal, the captain, um, when, when the other troops came in, they thought they were the reinforcements. So, so nobody knew they were going to be told to lay down their arms. And the first time we did it, it was, it was then e towards the evening of the first day of shooting that. And when, uh, we mistimed it. And, and the, 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 the new army pointed their guns right early in the scene. And the militia fled. And they, and, and they weren't there. And we got two cameras filming them all. And, and they just disappeared. They legged it and they went down behind the... Um, there was a drop in the a terrace and they were out of sight. And we were shooting nothing. So we, um, we, we regrouped in the morning and they had to retime it so that a lot of the dialogue happened before they pointed their guns. Um, but the other thing they didn't know um, was that Blanca was going to be killed. And she didn't know. And there was a, on the second day, um, I, I had to tell her. And uh, I said, um, Rosanna, I said, I've got some bad news now. And um, we were away from the, other, the others. And I said, Rosanna, I'm really sorry, but um, um, you die here. Um, and she said, I don't want to die. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'm really sorry. It's, you know, it's, it's what happens. So anyway, she went. But, and... Um, and, and, but when, when the thing happened and she ran back, nobody knew she was going to get killed. And I think the, the I don't know, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that the, the depth of feeling that they, they generated um, when came from the adrenaline of that shock. Um, and that if we hadn't done that, it, you know, if he'd rehearsed it, it would have been a bit dead. 
Um, and the, the other thing we did was the um, when she went back to the village, we'd rehearsed I'd, with her the two parents. Um, I'd, I'd done a little scene before, right before we started filming, where they'd met and, and they'd worked out in, and they we'd done a little improvisation where they said goodbye to her and you're going to fight and you know just look after yourself and all that. And and I said there'll be a scene when she comes back. You know you'll see her again. So um, so um, I, 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 I said okay. So we got the village and I said okay she's going to come back now. And they um, and of course they didn't know she'd be in the cart. Um, and it's I don't know it it it, it, it creates a kind of en- it creates um, it creates an energy really um, that I think if you'd you know if we premeditated it would have. Well, I don't know. Who knows? But it it, it creates an energy. Um, does anybody have a, a question in, in the audience? Or a thought? Could be a thought. A thought. Yes, sir. Um, um, can we get a, a microphone to this gentleman right here? Thank you. Mm-hmm. You've always been one of my heroes. I've done a great discourse myself. I've always admired you, respected you, held a lot. All the years I've been watching films, you're the one director that made me want to do the course at the city this time I've done it. I think you're incredible, you're one of the most amazing directors I've ever seen. Okay. To me, it's pretty... oh, yeah. 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 That's really kind of you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Uh, there's a guy right at the back. Oh, there's somebody right at the back. I think there's... I think... I, I don't know what glasses are. Of course, I've got them. Yes, I can see. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, you, you next. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this works. Uh, uh, I can talk loudly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was actually quite curious. I mean, obviously, the collective relations scene is, is fantastic. I was curious of where you would stand in that scene. What would what would you have said as as Ken Loach in that? That's one quick one. And, and, and secondly, uh, another thing actually about uh, another film of yours, uh, Red and Roses. I want to know if you were aware of the similar struggles going on of migrant workers here in the UK right now in grassroots trade unions that are organizing, particularly Cleveland. I work for the IWGB, which is one of the unions organizing that, and I. Want to see if we can talk at some point about potentially supporting what we're doing. Thank you. Um, okay, th- that's a challenge. I'd, I'd like to think, I mean, you never know how you'd respond. Yeah. I'd like to think I, I would have argued for um, um, full collectivization because I, th- I think um, what the older man says is quite true um, is that there are moments, there are critical moments, which if you take them at the flood, you know, as the man says in Julius Caesar, lead on. And I think this was such a moment. And if the revolution had happened in Spain, who knows what would have happened in the rest of Europe? You know, it would have dealt a blow against fascism, which the British were quite prepared to see win in Spain. It would have dealt that blow. It, it would have changed history. Um, but also, I think it's it seemed the right thing to do, you know, when, when people take power into their hands, as they did, you know, they said the land is ours, the factories are ours, we can run it, you know, we don't need to be exploited to till the fields, then, then that was the moment to strike, and you can't, you can't recreate that, you know, so I think, I think that, that was the right decision to have taken, um, and I, I, whether I'd have had the guts to do it, God knows, I, I don't know. Um, I think that the, the, the struggle you're talking about now is, is, for, um, is for, for, for cleaners, yes? Cleaners, yeah. There's, there's two trade unions organising cleaners, yes. mainly throughout London, grassroots. Yes. The United Voice of the World and the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain. Yes. And uh, we're very small, very grassroots, and obviously, as such, limited resources. Yeah. So, uh, we welcome any support we can get. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we, we've done shows for cleaners before in Canary Wharf and different places. Um, so, yeah, we'll exchange emails at the end. And, Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very important struggle, really, that. Um, very important. Um, because, I mean, we're, we're a low-wage, casualised labour force. And um, that, that is now when it'll, it'll get more intense after Brexit, no doubt. So, um, absolutely needs support. Yes, there was somebody. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'd like to echo the sentiment of the gentleman in the, um, at the front. Um, I think it's an incredible film. Um, thanks for making it. Um, I, I just thought that this film might be slightly different um, in your general oeuvre, um, and it's, quite, it's got quite a lot of action in it, um, like set piece fights. Um, and the, the one film I thought was quite similar was The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Um, I wondered if um, you saw any similarities between those two films um, and the conversation that, that I felt was a crucial moment in this, um, as well as the wind that shakes the barley, the collectivization conversation and, and when, when they took power, I just thought um, if you could speak about that, that would be great. Um, well, yes, I mean, they are dangerously similar and, and we were obviously well aware of that. Um, but it, the, the, the problem is it, it's the patterns of history that repeat. Um, you know, the independence struggle, there were many elements on, on, in the Republican side. Um, I mean, by the time it came to War of Independence, the Connolly element, the, the socialist element, was, was quite weak. In a way, we, we emphasised that more than one could justify historically, but in order to make the, the story. Um, but yes, I mean, I think when there's something as uh, such a big upheaval, it, it throws up all those different possibilities. I mean, the English Civil War was another case, wasn't it, with the levellers and the diggers, you know, and Gerard Green Stanley and um, all that uh, element, the, the revolutionary element that Cromwell annihilated. Um, it was there, you know, it was there in the French Revolution and so on. It was there, obviously, the Russian Revolution and Stalin squashed large elements of it. So it's... it's, when, it's it's those moments of possibility which are, which, are, which are so important and so beguiling to, to explore um, and, and so, so desperately needing to be told, really, because that's when we could have done it, you know. There are times when we could have done it, that the Spain was won. Um, so, um, so, yes, there are similarities, but it's, you know, it's the moment when the prize was there and it just slip from our grasp. Yes. Um, oh yes, go ahead. Hello. Uh, I would like to, to thank you. Um, I, I watched the film when, when, uh, 20 years ago, something like that. And up until then, I thought that once I were the good or the, the bad, my two grandparents were in the Franco's prison. So for me it was clear who were the, the bads. And after watching your film, I realized that things were much more difficult, more complex, and I started um, reading a lot of books about the Spanish Civil War. Uh, so uh, thank you for making us to understand a bit of part of our stories as well. Oh, th th thanks very much, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, go, go there, please, yes. Can, can I be the second person to echo what the guy at the front said? <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, we need filmmakers like you to carry on. So, are you doing another film? And if so, have you got anything in That's mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, when you get old, um, you take... I know. You, 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 <laughs> He, he, oh, he, come on. <laughs> well, you he, he, he know what footballers say, you take each game as it comes in. And um, I think it's the same with films, really. You're just, just pleased, to, you're pleased to wake up, never mind anything else. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, there are. I mean, there are Would all you make one for Lancastrian accents like mine, please? Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Okay. Um, well, I think. I mean, there's so many stories to tell. I mean, this is what, what's extraordinary. Um, I mean, I think now, I mean, you, you talk about now, and I, I'd agree, I think, 
I, to me, and uh, I don't know if others would agree, I think it is a really critical moment because it's the first time in, I think it's the first, first time in my time I've been involved in films and politics and things like that, that, that there's been a leader of the Labour Party that has actually stood with workers when they've been on strike. First time, I think it's the first time in the history of the Labour Party. I mean, Clement Hackley, founder of the welfare state, sent in troops against strikers. So I think it's a, an amazing moment. And if we could keep them in place, Corbyn and McDonald, and if they get the right support, and if where they're weak, others can make them strong, I think we could see some real changes. I think they're still left social democrats, but I think they could be edged towards socialism. And I think that, that's an... I never thought I'd sit in and say that about the Labour Party. But I think it is extraordinary. And, um, and, and the, we know it because the whole press, BBC and ITV, are against it. Even Peter sadly to say... The, I, I really, I, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm not attacking the Majesty's <laughs> Guardian newspaper. Well, uh, not entirely. Cause, uh, Steve Bell, drawing of Tom Watson, is worth the price of the paper alone. So that, that he's brilliant. But I think the... Um, the I think it's an extraordinary moment, um, you know, where they're actually proposing a cut to cut back on when capital needs to expand to cut back on capital, to throw them out of the health service, to throw them out of housing, to throw them out of transport. You know, th these are major changes if they could be achieved, um, and I think that's an extraordinary moment, and it won't last. I, I feel the door's been pushed open, but whether people get through it or not depends on what happens over the next few months, maybe a year. And if they're, if they're in place and people support them, then I think we can, things will change. If they're, if they're destroyed, and that's, not, that's well on the cards, then I think we're, you know, we, well, for, for the old ones like me, it's head in the gas all the time. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't see this opportunity coming again. You know, the Blairite, Brownite lot will take control again. And that's... And the left will be back to selling each other newspapers. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a critical moment. <laughs> but it's true. It, it's, it's a I really... I'm arguing that selling newspapers is something to feast its more. No, no, I mean... I don't mean big... I mean the no. small newspapers that yes. you get outside, you know, political meetings. Yes. I, 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 think, I think it's a really critical moment. And... If, if, we can, if we can keep them in place and support them and develop their programme, then I think we could see the changes that people fought for in Spain. If we let them fall, then I think the future is very dark. Supposing the revolutionary movement had prevailed uh, in, uh, say, 1936, uh, what did you envisage uh, immediately uh, arising from that moment in Spain? That was not very clear. And I was wondering is that when you said that that could have uh, uh, had an effect on the rest of Europe, why should uh, that alone have had an effect when already uh, there was the Russian Revolution in 1917 already taking shape and growing? So what would... Uh, the revolutionary moment in Spain have added to it, and what did you envisage uh, happening in Spain if they had taken over? Um, well, I, I mean, it's one of the big ifs, isn't it? And, and who knows? I mean, it would have strengthened the, the working class movement throughout Europe, obviously. Um, it would have strengthened the anti-fascist movement. Yes. Um, it, it would have... Um, it would have challenged um, France and Britain um, again. Who I say? I mean, Britain actually got Franco into Spain. I mean, they, they, there was a British plane, I think, that brought him into Spain. So it would have challenged that. We're given a huge boost. It would have been a big defeat for Hitler and Mussolini. And I think it might have, it, it might have created the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. It might have stopped the Soviet Union. There. I know that's the, I think that's possibly one of the key things. Uh, it might well have done that. That's a fascinating what if, but I don't know. There's one question here, Yes, I'm so sorry. Hi, it's fine. Um, I 
was thinking a lot, I'd wa I watched a lot about what Peter said at the start, that you know, we don't get taught about the Spanish Civil War at school. The Nazis are far more kind of trendy. Um, and I think part of the reason is that civil wars are very complicated and nuanced, and it's hard to know who to side with. So watching this in a week when there was you know, chemical warfare in Syria, I wonder how you reflect on that and actually kind of somebody I consider far wiser than most of the people in power at the moment. What on earth do you think we should do? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> It, it, it's a bit, to you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit beyond the pay grade, actually, that question. Um, well, I, I, I think... Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I think the, the easy bit of what you said is, no, we don't get talked about the Spanish Civil War, um, maybe partly because uh, Britain was on the wrong side. The, the, the political class, was, the political groups were on the wrong side. Even the Labour Party made concern with the effect on British jobs. It was the rank and file who went to fight, but the party as a, at the top was not very um, supportive at all. Um, so I think that's one reason we don't get taught. Um, and it, it's easy to be anti-Hitler, but how are they going to teach it to be anti-Franco when the British Parliament was supporting it? Um, what do we do now? Well, I mean, I don't know where, 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 where to begin. Um, I think you have to begin by at least by telling the truth. I mean, the, the Americans used chemical weapons in the Iraq war in Fallujah, and there are many horrific pictures of the deformed children that have been born because of the American uh, chemical weapons that we used, that we tolerated. So I think the moral high ground doesn't exist here. When we talk about chemical weapons, it's a great pity we don't have that perspective when we're when we hear it discussed on the news. Um, I think the last thing we should be doing is dropping bombs. I think in the end, the only recourse we have is international law. The moment you, you, you say, okay, what it needs is a cowboy to ride in and get the guns out of his holster and start shooting, you know, where did that, there is no end to that. And I think international law has to be our recourse. And we have to, I would suggest, I mean, one thing we have to do is to start working with the non-aligned countries and build a movement in the United Nations generally, because the United the Security Council is 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 always going to is always got this fault line that somebody can say a, a, a veto. But we've got to build a movement in the United Nations generally, General Assembly, a big um, non-aligned movement, really. And uh, I think that's I don't know. I mean, that, that, that just seems to me something that we should start considering. But uh, I don't know. I'm sure your, your thoughts are as valid as mine. Thank you. Yes, do we have a, a microphone? Yes, to, yeah. Yes. Hi there. Um, I think the relevance of this film to 2017 is kind of even beyond like the fight against fascism. It's also kind of about, you know, infighting on the left. And I'm interested in your thoughts on, um, you know, David's role of this in the film because at times he seems like an idealist. He talks in his letters to back home about how he's a changed man, this being in Spain has changed his life, but also we see how um, you know, he kind of takes a pragmatic decision to leave the militia and kind of, you know, after he's injured. So I'm just kind of interested how you saw him as a character um, within that context. Um, I, I think it was the, um, I mean, the, the, the critical thing for him was, was going and believing that by joining the Communist Party, he was joining a revolutionary party. Going to Spain was part of a revolutionary act. And then discovering that the real politique that came from Moscow was not that. And it was um, that the Spanish Revolution was expendable. And then he tears up his party card. I mean, that, that was, it was a very simple journey, really. But that, that, that was the journey. Um, and, I mean, the, the rest is just idiosyncratic things that people do, you know, that, I mean, he's just a working class lad, he's, he's, you know, he just confronts life as, it, as he sees it. Um, but I think what, finding himself shooting across at a lad from Manchester, and you've both gone there to be, to fight against fascism, and here you are fighting yourself. I mean, that, that's the absurdity. Um, 
But that, that's the absurdity, and, and that hits him, and he says, I can't have any part in this. And I think that, I mean, that's bedeviled the left, hasn't it, for you know, the, the whole century, is the sectarianism. Um, and, um, and we're seeing it now, we're seeing it now, you know, the, the manipulators and the fixers, so that Tom Watson will call, come out before Jeremy Corbyn, knowing what Corbyn's position is, so that he can say, yes, the Americans did a good thing in bombing. It's, it's petty, it's short-sighted, it's unprincipled, and it's devious. And we know, everybody can see what he's up to. He doesn't give a toss whether they bomb or not. It, it's, it's, uh, Jim Allen had a phrase for it, actually, for politicians like that. He used to say they have jungle agility. <laughs> you know, they're very good at just seeing an opportunity and, you know, seeing I can get to that branch. I can't, that, that, that ad adept adroitness. But principle, forget it. You know, and I think that's what we're seeing in the Labour Party now, that sort of desperate, dark sectarianism, manipulation, fixing. Um, and it was certainly in Spain, and it, it's dogged left politics um, for as long as anyone can remember. But, you know, you, you just have to work against it. You, know, you just have to work against it. There's Justine, I think it's... Can yeah, yeah. And yes. there's a woman here too. Uh, no, no, I'll be just with you. Um, Ken, thank you so much for an absolutely extraordinary screening this evening. It was just wonderful to watch the film on the big screen. I wanted to ask you about your heroes, the influences on you as a filmmaker, because you have become such an important filmmaker for us. So I don't know if there are um, any filmmakers uh, in the generations above you who you think used film as a powerful agent of social change and, and who they were, um, and, and whether or not they influenced your filmmaking style in Land and Freedom and other films that you've made. Um. Yeah, well, um, a bit, Peter will know the answer to this, I'm sure. You, you, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the... Uh, well, no, no, you go. Okay. I mean, it's the... Um, the, the there are two or three, really. Um, the, the, obviously, the Italians from the 50s, um, you know, that, that put the working class on the screen, um, and De Sica amongst them was the best, because he seemed to be the most human. Um, so him... Um, the Czech film, just for the enjoyment of cinema, the Czech filmmakers, I, I, I could watch again and again. Um, and Milos Forman and Yuri Mansell in particular. Um, because there's just a, a generosity of spirit in them. And, but the, the technical, the te just dissecting their technique is very simple, but it's, it was... The, the, the golden rules, well, the golden rules, I mean, the, the kind of way I, you know, the, that I've tried to approach sequences have been how they did it, really. Or how I, I deduce they did it from just looking at how they, where they put the camera, the lenses they used, how they edited. Um, so the, the, they're the biggest. But the other, um, um, the, the Battle of Algiers, great film. Um, and... Um, so there's a, I think there's only a handful, and then after that you really got to you got to work it out yourself. I think, really. Thank you very much. I think this lady here wants to make a quick, if you could, a yes. quick one. Yes, please. This the Spanish civil wars has a very romantic uh, people who went to join it for some idealism and some And I was just wondering, eighty years later. There is no such. I couldn't think of where we would go, and then suddenly it occurred to me that there is still some idealistic young people who go and join Daesh because that's what they go there for. They have this very idealistic thing about Islam and the purity of it, and they join something which is quite awful. And seeing your film, I also realized that. It was not a whole, the people, the Republican side was not 
pure and united against the fascists. Mm. The other thing is because of where I was brought up. I was brought up on the other side in France and in the Basque country, Catalan Basque. So I've known a lot of refugees from Spain. And I have a friend who lived in Paris. And every August she came on holiday and she wouldn't set foot in Spain and while Franco was alive. And she used to have a meeting with her family on either side of the bridge in Andal. She was on the French side and she waved to them. They were on the Spanish side and they waved to her. And she went to Spain the day after he died. And she bought a house and she retired there. And it, it's something, you know, because also when I went to San Sebastian uh, as a child during the holiday, he was holidaying there. And the place was full of Guardia Civil, even when he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. When we saw the Guardia Civil, I cannot tell you the fear it put in our heart, you know, with their shiny heart and that and thing. And the first time I went to Spain after he died, they were gone. And the police was in blue, and they didn't wear a weapon, and 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 they could fly the Basque flag. They, they could speak Basque. They could dance that Basque. You know, it, it was something physically liberating mm -hmm. to, to see that. Well, I think I mean I mean thank you for the stories, and and I think the. The, the point you make about um, where are the battles now? I mean, the, 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 one of the big causes in the 80s, of course, were the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and, and that's where the writer I work with, and I've worked with for a long time, Paul Laverty, um, went there and, and fought and didn't fight. He went as a, a legal um, observer to observe the human rights abuses by the American back contra. So there were causes, and, and I think, you see, we're, we're at the good causes, well, get the cleaners a decent wage and secure, secure jobs, these are the causes, we don't have to go far, you know, these are the causes. Um, and uh, the, 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 the big international causes, um, well, they'll come round again, I'm sure, but the, um, and people have been to Palestine, people have volunteered in Palestine, people have gone to Gaza, very brave, and that's a great cause too. So and, and I think there are great causes, but, but the political struggle is, is in your street. You know, it, it's in the people you see and the people who, who you see um, working um, and the people who are being exploited. Um, and they're everywhere. And uh, if you're interested in a campaign, tap it on blue tube and one will pop up and uh, I'm sure it will be yours or someone else's. So, um, yeah, I think it's, if there is a moral, uh, um, I'm afraid my friends isn't good enough to say it, but let the, the, the lead continue, the struggle continues. <laughs> well, what, if I may say so, I'm going to end on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please be joining once again and giving a round of applause for this time. Oh, right. Thank you.